Armin Shimmerman, everybody. Hello, hello. Would you mind, Heather, if yes. I sat over here? Yeah. Because I'm short and the table just takes up all of them. Heather, do you have a question? I'm sure the audience has questions. Yes, so. let's start. Okay, so I know that you just completed your run in the play that goes wrong. That's right, yeah. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the show and maybe your venture into theater, which I know also includes Shakespeare as well. Well, I started my career in the theater. I think of myself as a theater actor, and I just finished a production, as Heather just said, of the play that goes wrong. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware of that play. It's uh, it's uh, been around for only a couple of years, but uh, it's playing off Broadway, I think, right now, and it's in the West End as well. I did my production in Kansas City, and uh, it's a play. Uh, as the title suggests, everything goes wrong. The set is the diva. She, it, the, the set is the primary character of the play, and it does whatever it wants to do. And we, as the characters doing the play, have to deal with a set that is uh, uh, doing whatever it wants to do. Um, but my background is primarily in the theater. Um, I'm also a scholar. Uh, I've, I teach Shakespeare at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, my books, that, that's primarily why I'm here this weekend, which is uh, to sell my books, introduce people to my books. My books are about uh, Shakespeare and, and about the historical characters who lived around Shakespeare's time. So uh, that's primarily why I'm here. Um, I have been lucky enough to do, I don't know, um, over 200 productions, uh, TV, film, games. Uh, so I've been very lucky, a very lucky actor who um, was in the right place at the right time. That's awesome, and I'm such a fan of, of Shakespeare as well. Um, and of course, there's a lot of superstitions in theater in general, like it's the Scottish play. You don't call it by the other name, and I will not since we are in a theater. Um, I was wondering if there was other superstitions that maybe you particularly follow, or if you think they're a little silly. Um, I don't like to know who's in the audience. That's my personal uh, superstition. I. Um, I don't really care about uh, saying the Scottish play one way or another. Do you know why that's a tradition? I actually don't. Uh, because I'm a scholar, I will now inform you as to why that tradition is around. And that's why we're here, okay. <laughs> so, uh, in the 1800s, uh, actors used to travel around in England uh, under a, what's called a, a, an actor manager. There were no directors, it was actor managers who directed the plays. And they, they rarely did, if I may, Macbeth. They rarely did Macbeth because that was such a favorite that they usually saved that to the end. The actor manager would hold off doing Macbeth because when they got in trouble, they, if they did Macbeth, they could probably re recoup their losses. So when the other actors in the company heard that the actor manager wanted to do Macbeth, there was the possibility, the very real possibility, that they weren't going to get paid, nor were they going to have money to travel back from wherever they were in England or in Germany, uh, back to London, to their home. So mentioning Macbeth was a no-no, and that's where that tradition started. Interesting, right? And selfishly, since we are here with someone on your level, I know there is a lot of theories that people talk that Shakespeare isn't necessarily Shakespeare. It's a culmination of multiple humans. Can I get your? I think that's that? Homer. Homer is a, is a combination of multiple humans. Uh, usually, with Shakespeare, they suggest it's one or two or three or four different other people. Um, I will tell you from my point of view very quickly. Um, I have been an actor all my life. Shakespeare was an actor. We all know that Shakespeare was an actor in the, in the King and Queen's Company. We know that that's a fact. Uh, no one argues that. But the question is whether he wrote the plays or not. So uh, I have worked on a many a new play. And when you're doing a new play, you, uh, when you don't understand something in the play, it doesn't have to be a Shakespearean play, it can be a modern play. You say to the writer who's there, um, excuse me, I, I don't understand this reference. Can you tell me what it means? You wrote the play, you should know. And usually they explain it to you. Now, I, it's very hard for me to believe that for the 20 years that Shakespeare was in this company, that the other actors who were all friends of his would turn to him and say, uh, Will, you know, uh, who is Jupiter, for instance? Um, and he said for 20 years, he said, I'll get back to you on that, that he didn't know what, what was in the plays. I don't think that could have happened. The other thing is, um, having been an actor, been in the theater community all my life, I know that no one in the theater community can hold a secret. So you're, you can't tell me that for all the years that Shakespeare 
uh, didn't write the plays, that the actors in the company kept that a secret from everybody else. Not possible. And my final Shakespeare question, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a correct way to learn iambic pentameter, or would you say it's the same way as learning any of your other lines, just with the beats? Uh, I'm a teacher of Shakespeare. I rarely teach iambic pentameter. So uh, I think iambic pentameter is a necessary tool as far as, as, as knowing it's there. Sometimes it can help with pronunciation. But uh, I think anyone who's more concerned about iambic pentameter than they are about trying to communicate to an audience what's happening on stage is a fool. Very fair. I, I feel like it's kind of ingrained in you when you're like, especially. Yes, you have bad teachers. That's the problem. That, the that, reason, the reason that why is people, true. The, the reason why people don't like Shakespeare, don't understand Shakespeare, can't, you know, are frightened by Shakespeare is because of the bad teachers we've had in, in elementary school who didn't understand it either. So they passed along their fear. One of the things I do as a teacher, not bragging, just one of the things I do is to take that fear away. It's very easy to understand Shakespeare better. Not 100%, because there are words that are not the same. I mean, who in the audience knows what a whiz, a whiz means? Um, only I do. Um, and, but for the most part, Shakespeare is much easier than you think it is. It's just that we've been trained to fear it. Thank you. That, that's exactly my question. Uh, so just to pivot slightly, uh, you were part of the wonderful cast of Beauty and the Beast, the TV series. And I know you had a conversation with Ron Perlman about wearing facial prosthetics. Was this a Yes. When I got hired to play Quark on Deep Space Nine, I had, I had worked two years with Ron in Beauty and the Beast, and I, he had a tremendous amount of makeup in that show. And when I, I was signed up for um, my role on Deep Space Nine, I was concerned about you know, wearing that makeup for a long time, a long time. And I called Ron up and uh, I asked him several questions. One was about the makeup. And he said, uh, Armin, uh, while you're getting made up, think of the money. So that's what I mean. Because <laughs> it paid for my house. The overtime paid for my house. <laughs> What, what were those prosthetics like that you had to wear? Because Frankies are, are pretty intricate. Um, they're made out of rubber, foam rubber. Uh, the irony is the Ferengi have very large ears, but because there was a lot of rubber right here, I was practically deaf. Um, I, if you didn't look me straight in the face, I couldn't hear what you were saying. So um, uh, they're foam rubber. They're put on with a medical adhesive. It took about two hours for the application every day. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. Um, I also wanted to, t to ask you about your time on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Sure. And yes, we can clap for that, as we should. Uh, I was curious if you believe in demons or cryptids or anything of the sort. Um, no, I don't believe in any of that. Um, it was great fun to do Buffy. The irony is uh, I did Buffy and Star Trek exactly the same time. There were many, many weeks where I was Quark on Monday and I was Snyder on Friday. Um, and that was a lovely experience. Um, difficult, but a lovely experience. Uh, they, uh, the characters on Buffy hated me. They should. I was an asshole. Uh, <laughs> but um, but, the, but the, uh, off camera, uh, we had a very good relationship. If I may, I'll tell you one quick story about Buffy. Um, at the end of Buffy, they were shooting their last episode. They had killed my character off two seasons before. But I got a phone call from the office, uh, from Buffy office, asking me if I would participate in a photo shoot on the, on the last day of shooting of Buffy. And because Buffy had hundreds of recurring characters, I expected a huge crowd there. When I got to the, to the set, I, there were only four of us, four of us waiting to join the cast for, and the crew for a picture. And uh, I was surprised by that, and I went in. Uh, on the set, said hello to my friends that I hadn't seen for a couple of years. Had a lovely reunion. We took the picture. Um, I started walking back to my car. I was walking back with Joss Whedon, um, who was the creator of the show. And I told Joss what I just told you. I, I was surprised there were only four of us. And uh, he smiled and said, Armin, remember my character on Buffy. He said, Armin, you four are the only four that all of us liked. <laughs> So, uh, yes, they hated me on camera, but uh, we got along fine off camera. I love that. Okay, so I'll ask a final question, then we can go to some questions from y'all from the audience. 
Uh, so you mentioned that you're here promoting um, your written works as well. Uh, when did you first start writing and what can you tell us about your books? I started, I started writing when I was eight years old um, and I won a couple of awards for poetry. I started writing novels in my trailer on Deep Space Nine because I had nothing to do and there was nothing on TV. Uh, and so I just started to write. I, I've, I've published three science fiction novels. That trilogy is called Merchant Prince. Um, one of the authors that helped me with the writing of the first book of Merchant Prince uh, suggested the idea of what my um, Illyria books became. And uh, he just suggested the idea and, and I wrote it myself. And I started to write those in my trailer as well. And uh, it took me about 20 years to write the three books. Um, and when I sold it to Jumpmaster Press, uh, they were wise enough to say, Armin, you don't have one book, you have three books. So um, it's been a long time process. I'm very grateful for it. Um, it's a terrible thing to say, but if I had to choose between acting and writing, I would take writing every day. Um, acting is a lovely profession, but it's, it's child's play compared to writing. And um, do you intend to write more in the future? Anything in the works currently? I, I have, I hope to write more, but my next project, I believe, will be a, a nonfiction book. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a teacher of Shakespeare. I think I'm going to write a textbook about what I teach. Very cool. Awesome. Well, we look forward to it. That's great. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to back up so you can see the people asking the questions as I drop my phone. All right. What's your name? What's your question? Uh, hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Wave your hand so I can see where you are. Oh, there you go. Okay. And uh, I was curious, the links to Star Trek and Shakespeare go all the way back to the 60s. How do you feel about all the Shakespeare references that are laced throughout the Star Trek universe? Um, I'm very fond of that. Uh, not only do the writers uh, are interested in Shakespeare, but most of the, the lead actors on all of the Shakespeare series that I know of anyway, are all classical actors like myself uh, who are steeped in Shakespeare, so they're usually very happy to do that. Um, science fiction and Shakespeare has always gone well together as well, so Star Trek being a genre part of, of science fiction, it, it seems natural to have Shakespeare references. But, but science fiction tends to be a little bit more literary than most, and again, uh, references to Shakespeare are, uh, are to be expected. Thank you for the question. Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm actually from the Alpha Quadrant, Sector 001. So you can assume what my question is going to be about today. Okay. Um, as you know, uh, Deep Space Nine is an incredible series. And when it comes to Quark, uh, you know, he was a lover, a fighter, a cheater, a thief. You know, he was everything that made Star Trek into one person. And I could not imagine anyone else ever playing that role, you know, the way that you handled it. I mean, every time you would come on and say the word human, uh, human. My, my wife would start laughing and just say, I love me some pork. So, and so you're, thank you. And that's, you know, well, and I appreciate that too. But the, uh, my question is, is with all of the acting and all that you've done with your vast career, when you're like reading the script itself, and, you know, when Quark's sitting here reading, you know, like one, two, three, four, when Armin read it, did he add to it? Did he ad lib something extra? Did you, this one specific instance where the script looked good, but you took it, took it to the next level? That's an interesting question, and thank you for that. There was a dictum on Star Trek, at least in the years that I was there, so this applied to uh, not so much the next generation, at least not in the very beginning, but certainly for Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and I, and I don't know about Enterprise, but I would assume it's the same. We were not allowed to change anything, not a syllable. Uh, they got a little uh, upset if we changed a comma. Um, so for the most part, I would say 99.9% .9 of everything you hear on our shows anyway was exactly as written. Now, there were things that actors could do, not change the words, but there are things that we could do to alter what was written on the page. Every actor has that ability in any project that they, that they are involved in. So when I read the script, I wasn't looking to make changes. I was trying to get into the head of the writer who wrote the script and what is it they wanted my character to do. Most of the time I would say up front, yeah, okay, great, I can do that. Sometimes uh, I thought, 
you know, we can go in a different path than I think they want us to go. And because the writers were rarely on the set, we usually got away with it because there was nobody there to tell us. I will tell you a story. Um, there's a very famous scene that I'm involved with with the character of Garrick. Don't everyone know the, well, those who watch the show anyway. Does anyone know the root beer scene from Deep Space yeah. Nine? Yes. Okay. So when, when Andy and I, Andy played Garrick, when Andy and I played, uh, looked at that, that scene together, they came over to the house to, to read it over with me. And we realized there was more to that scene than perhaps the writers had thought. We thought it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to show the, um, the Machiavelli, which is Garrick, of the show, and the comic Machiavelli, which was myself, to go a little further to talk about Starfleet. And, and although we said the lines as written, we said in a certain way that everyone knew we were talking about something else besides root beer. Um, and, and so that's the way actors have a, the ability to change the lines without actually changing the words. You did it very well. Thank I you. Say Thank if you. we love some poor. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you again. I'm Devin from Indianapolis. Right. Um, my question, again, it's a Deep Space Nine question. Um, when you look at how Fringies were when they first started Star Trek and Next Generation, kind of trying to set them up as the... the <laughs> I know, because I was the, the arch one. I was there. <laughs> but, um, th I mean, the way they changed it and kind of went the direction about the profit and all that, how much of it was written? How much of it did they let kind of you do in terms of developing what a Fringie was going to be all about? I, I'm, I'm going to answer that, Devin, slightly the way I answered the last one. We, we, the actors, could not change anything. We could change interpretation, as I just said. We could not change lines. We could make suggestions, which were rarely followed. Uh, I know that three times a year I would take the writers out to lunch and make some suggestions. I remember begging them many times. Just tell me what his IQ is. Just tell me. Because sometimes he's smart and sometimes he's not. Just tell me what his IQ is. Um, but, we, but the change, the change from the TNG Ferengi that I created, because I'm the actor, the main Ferengi in that first episode, to Quark and all the Ferengi that followed me, um, I so hated my performance in Next Generation. That's why I did this. If you look, that's, that's just how I played Leto. It's just like this, which is Richard III. But, um, uh, but, but it was wrong. It was horrible. And, and, and I've said this for years now. Um, my whole agenda as Quark was to try to wipe out that performance from the Next Generation. Um, and I, I was so one-dimensional. It was a horrible performance. Um, the only thing good about it was the check, and, and it didn't bounce. Um, but, uh, but Quark was my agenda was to try to make that one-dimensional creature uh, into a three-dimensional person. And in fact, uh, you may not agree with me, but I've said this for years, and so have many of the other Ferengi. Um, the Ferengi, you may not like this, the Ferengi were the most human of creatures on, on Star Trek. Um, we are, you might not like the Ferengi, but a lot of the characteristics that the, that the Ferengi have are very much human characteristics. Um, and so um, I was happy to do that, very happy to do that. And, and to make him, as you said, many faceted, many faceted. So the writers were the ones that pivoted and kind of went towards. Yeah, That's yeah. I, I think that had a little to do with me. Uh, the writers saw who the actors were in all cases and they would write for the actors. And uh, they found me to be um, a more three-dimensional person than just uh, a Ferengi. Well, you killed it, so <laughs> thank you. Kudos. Hi. Uh, my question is, if you have a favorite Shakespeare play. I don't have a favorite Shakespeare play. Usually my favorite play is the one that I'm directing or acting in. Uh, and since I'm not doing any right now, I don't have a favorite. Um, I've done many productions of Hamlet. I've, rare, I've never played Hamlet. I've played a lot of the other characters. I've done many productions of Much Ado, which I've directed. My book uh, is about Twelfth Night, so uh, there's that. So 
in, in accordance with the fact that my favorite is always the one I'm working on. Since I'm here this weekend selling books, I would say Twelfth Night because my book is about Twelfth Night. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm just learning that you have been in the play that goes wrong in Kansas City, but I'm a big fan of the play that goes wrong and everything that that set of writers has written. And in particular, what I love hearing about is stories about people performing the play that goes wrong and then something actually goes wrong. Yes. People in the audience maybe don't catch it. So I was wondering if you had any stories of things that went wrong when you were actually yes, acting that out. I, I do. Uh, thank you for that. That's very. That's a very sweet question. So in this play, lots of things go wrong that are scripted, but you're absolutely right. This play is dangerous for actors. And, uh, and things go wrong that are, are not scripted, and you have to deal with it while you know 700 people are watching you on stage thinking they're watching the play. So um, unfortunately for us, as has happened in many theaters, uh, while we were doing this play, uh, which I just finished, I finished on July the 3rd, um, um, all of the cast, including myself, caught COVID. So we had a lot of understudies go on at different times. Um, if you know the play and you do, there's a moment when um, uh, Mr. Collymore comes in with a, with a fire extinguisher because there's a, there's a fire on stage. Okay, so I, I was playing the butler and, um, uh, and I was blocked to be, um, so, Let's say this is the door right here. So he would come in from here, and I was about here having just dealt with the fire. Um, and usually, the actor who, who played Collie Moore um, would open the door about halfway. And, uh, uh, and, and I was used to that. But on this particular night, when the understudy was on, who was eager to do a good performance, he just whipped that door open. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I was standing in the way of the door. And uh, it hit me, I saw stars. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, there's always a, a divan there, a couch. I fell over the couch um, and onto the floor. And I, I wasn't sure if I had been uh, cut or not. And I sort of surreptitiously, it's amazing what actors can do, hoping the audience doesn't see them do it. I just sort of went and, and to see if I was bleeding. Um, I wasn't bleeding, but I got the biggest bump on my head, uh, larger than any Ferengi lobe. Um, <laughs> and, and for about two days, uh, uh, I put makeup on it, but it was a, it was a goose egg. So uh, that's what happened to me. And there were other things that happened. One actor, uh, had a terrible fall and had to leave the show because he broke his back. It, 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 yeah, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous show, but it's a very funny show. It's a very funny show. Thank you for asking. Thanks for sharing, Matt. You're welcome. So, uh, Ork is a character who likes, like, seems to hate humanity in a lot of He it. doesn't. No, 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 no. Uh, Ork never hated humanity. Well, he seems like kind of in tip of that's set against their ways in lots of ways. He, he had his, yes, okay, I'll let you finish your question, then I'll answer it. Go what? Ahead. Yeah, I, I'm probably saying this wrong, but why did he always seem to want their respect so much, even though sometimes they were so against him in his ways? Okay, interesting question. Um, first of all, as far as I could see yeah. it, not, I'm not the writer, I'm just the actor, I'm just the talent, as they say. Yeah. Um, I don't think Quark didn't like humanity. Uh, uh, I don't think that at all. I think, I th as he says in the program, um, I'm a people person, I, and I think that's who Quark was. He, he liked everybody who came into the bar. Um, he, he liked them, one, to get their money, yeah. and that's a, a story I should tell, and, um, and two, he liked, as I'm doing now, he liked to share, he liked to chat, he liked to do that. Um, uh, what he didn't necessarily like, is this, he was from a different culture than the human culture. And although he was living in a mostly human culture, he was acquiring their cultural beliefs as he lived there. But he had his own cultural beliefs that he was either proud of or was indoctrinated with. So he was matriculating from the Ferengi culture that he had grown up with uh, to the human culture that he was dealing with. 
So again, I don't think he disliked it. I think he was just in the process of changing. For instance, this, this, uh, this is Tennessee. I live in California. Uh, there are differences in cultures between Tennessee and, Col and California. And, and that's just in one country and in the same time. Um, people have differences. And, and good people respect other people's cultures. Well, so I guess it's essentially just the immig like an immigrant accumulating to a different culture, essentially, and learning their values. That's instead. right. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Great question. All right. We have about 10 minutes left, so let's do these final questions. Well, I know that the cast loved Far Beyond the Stars. Um, had you been clamoring for an episode like that where you went all natural or just the writers just said, hey, you don't have to wear makeup today and just... Uh, we, as you said, the cast love Far Beyond the Stars for many reasons. I don't think clamoring is the right way I would put it. Um, understand, it's like having ice cream. If you had ice cream every day, you probably wouldn't like ice cream. We liked the shows we did. We were very happy with the Star Trek shows. So to do one that was different um, was very tasty. And, and, and it wasn't that we were out of makeup. It, it was that we got to address some social issues that unfortunately are still in existence. Yes, sir. And, and, uh, and that was what we really wanted. If, if we had episodes where we were in makeup, and there were many of these, mm -hmm. where we were in, make, in makeup and addressing social uh, injustices, um, we like those as well. It's just the Far Beyond the Stars was the best of them for us. Thank you. I was wondering if you had a specific favorite Star Trek character or series out of all of them. Uh, at, a show or a character? A uh, character. A character. Yeah. Um, well, besides myself, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I had... Um, I love Garrick, so uh, Garrick is, is one of my favorite. And, um, and as the years have gone by, I, I would imagine I really like Nog a great deal. Yes, yeah, me too. So as for the other shows, <laughs> again, I say to you, the Ferengi were the most human of characters. Sometimes the Star Trek people, I know a lot of you are huge Star Trek fans, so am I. But they were a little too goody-goody for me at times, so. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I kind of like the aliens over the, over the humans. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, of all the episodes you did as Quark, which one is your most favorite? Well, besides Far Beyond the Stars, although that wasn't Quark, um, I would say, what was my favorite Ferengi episode? I can tell you my least favorite. That was uh, Prophet and Lace. Oh, I hated that one. Um, I think my favorite, you know what? Which one was my favorite? The first one, because I got the job. <laughs> that works. You've done a good job. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, I was wanting to know, speaking of the writing process earlier as well as uh, do me a favor, either come away from the crowd or take the mask off, because I can't hear you. Sorry. That, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the writing process earlier, and, and I was wondering if there's any overlap between, because uh, there are all, many people writing books, but not all of them are classically trained. So how much do you think that uh, influences your writing process, and to what degree, I guess? Oh, interesting question. How much does a classical experience and training influence my books? I would say a great deal. My books are primarily meant to be uh, pastiches of, of, of what I've read, uh, both as literature and as history. So, um, so yes, it influences a great deal. And, and I would imagine, though it isn't as much as a, an important influence, uh, it also affects my, my acting. Because mostly what I do uh, is classical theater. I've done more than half the Shakespearean plays, many plays uh, several times. So yes, uh, classical material does affect me. Um, and I'm always delighted when I hear a classical illusion in something, yeah. Hello, sir. So, got a question for you. What was it like working with Michael Dorn? <laughs> Michael. Uh, I love Michael. Michael is, is uh, all of them are friends, but Michael is one of my closest friends. 
I see Michael on a regular basis. Uh, Michael, what Michael has done with Wharf is truly phenomenal, and uh, it's great credit to him and to others that that wrote Wharf uh, what they've done. Um, I love Michael. However, <laughs> Michael, God bless him, has a problem memorizing lines. So what usually happens in TV is uh, they're moving as quickly as they can, which is slow, but for TV it's fast. And uh, usually the, you'll, you'll do little setups of you know, different camera angles, whether there's a, it's a three shot or a two shot or a close up. Those all take a different setup, a different lighting, everything has to be done differently for each of those uh, framing jobs. Um, uh, so usually you, you do it first time, um, and then uh, if they don't like it, they ask you to do it a second time. Hopefully you've got it right by then. And then what they say, just to, be, to cover themselves for insurance, they may do it a third time. And then they move on. You know, we're moving on. Um, but that means that you have to get the lines right. <laughs> uh, Michael didn't always get the lines right. <laughs> so sometimes, by the time we got to the 25th take, uh, Michael had the lines right, but I was done with that scene. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> But I love Michael. Michael is uh, truly one of my closest friends. And, and, and despite that, despite that, I still love him. Uh, he is the kindest, uh, most sympathetic, uh, funny uh, man uh, that I know. Really a charmer. And uh, you would be surprised if you haven't seen him lately. He doesn't look like Worf anymore. I suppose you will see him now on, I hope I'm not giving anything away. You'll see him on Picard. But um, as, uh, as Michael's lost a lot of weight, and as he said to me, one of his friends said to him, uh, said to Michael, Michael, uh, I think I can take you now. Because <laughs> he has uh, lost some weight. He's still, he's a wonderful man, a, a wonderful actor, and uh, a dear, 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 dear friend. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, the final question. All right, uh, I'm Tony from Cerebral. And uh, I believe you did a great job in uh, all the episodes of DS9 that I've also called you and Buffy. Um, I've heard rumors, well, I know cards, Star Trek cards going on. I've heard rumors that DS9 is trying, they're trying to do a Cisco episode. And, uh, and I know Kate Mulgrew is trying to get the board. Yes, Kate going. will come on to a new show, absolutely, yeah. Uh, well, when you did the uh, opening uh, Voyager, actually, you stole the show myself. So <laughs> that's why I believe. Uh, if they asked you today, uh, would you put on the makeup again to do the episode? Yes, I've been asked that question several times, and thank you for asking it again. I appreciate that. Um, the answer is that yes, absolutely, I would do it. Uh, ironically, at a convention about <coughs> right before COVID, um, someone paid me a ton of money to get dressed up as Quark one more time. And, and I said I would only do it if, um, if they brought my makeup artist, who was with me the whole seven years, Karen Westerfield. Must give a hand, round of applause. Karen. <laughs> um, so this was in England. And they paid for Karen to come out to England. They paid for me to come out to England. They paid for all of her materials. They paid her for her work, her time. Um, and when we brought, we had some costumes and we had the original rubber foam masks uh, from previous episodes that, that she and I had stolen over the course of 20 years. <laughs> um, and uh, when I put it on, Ira was there, Ira Bear, our, our executive producer. Um, we were all amazed because it was, it was a good 22, 23 years after I had finished the show. And w when I got into the makeup, it was like a time machine. It, I, it, was, it, it looked like Quark 20 years ago. I, I, I mean, granted, I'm, I'm 20 years older. There are bags under my eyes. I've got you know, less hair than I even had then. And, and, but it was, it was identical to what I looked like. 25 years before. So the answer is yes, I, I would happily do it. I would not do a series regular again. I would not, I would not undergo that makeup for another seven years. I, I, I can't live that long. Um, but, I, but for a guest star or to do what uh, they're going to do on Picard with some of the characters coming back, 
Um, I hope I'm not giving anything away. Um, um, yeah, I would do that. I would do that. But, 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 <laughs> they'd have to pay me like they pay Michael Dorn. <laughs> As they should. So, uh, Arvin, we actually have copies of your book up here if you wanted to uh, show them. But uh, sure. are, are there copies available at your table this weekend? Oh, yeah, my God, the table is about copies of my book. I, I, I'm primarily here not as an actor. It's nice to be on stage as an actor, and I love the questions. It's great. But I'm here primarily as an author. And indeed, uh, this, it's a trilogy. Two of the books are out. Uh, this is the first one, Betrayal of Angels, which, as I said, is a Shakespearean story. Uh, it is followed up by the next episode, uh, same, uh, same thing, Sea of Troubles, which is book two, and the third book, which is Imbalance of Power, I just finished writing about two weeks ago. Oh. So, um, uh, and we are selling all three. The third one, of course, you can't read, but we are doing pre-sales for that, which is coming out in January. Um, and I'm very proud of those books. I'm very proud of the acting work I've done. I've been fortunate to do a lot of different things. You know me as an actor primarily, and I'm very, I'm very happy for the opportunities that I got to do that. But I wasn't happy just acting. I wasn't happy, that, that, that wasn't enough creative outlet for me, so I took up writing, I took up some other things, took up directing, took up teaching, um, took up a lot of things that I'm very proud of. Um, and, and if you only know me as an actor, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much indeed. But um, there are more sides to me than, than perhaps you're aware of. Awesome. Well, this has been such a delight. And thank you for sharing your passions with us and sharing your stories with us. And uh, make sure to go check out his books at the table. Like you said, you're doing a pre-sale for our, the third one as well. Thank you so much again. This has been such a delight. Thank you, Heather. Armin Shimmerman, everybody. Hey, this is Bonnie Gordon and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self-destructs in five, four, three, two, one. Just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.